Welcome to the Maria Heller Show, the Internet's original podcast. Since the year 2000, always ahead of the curve, always on your side. A true warrior for truth and justice, Maria and her guests leave nothing out and no one is off limits. There is only one truth, the rest is lies. Sit back, enjoy the education with a true daughter of Mother Earth. Sharp New York wit, spiritual knowing, and a very dry sense of humor, Maria will dissect the news and lies to make it all palatable. Education is power. Maria delivers rapid-fire truth like no one else can. Here she is, the mouth that roars, the legendary Maria Heller. Uh, good morning, world. Maria here, alive and kicking. Welcome to Awaken with Maria and Monica. And uh, if you're not familiar with Monica's work, get over to Monica with two N's dot com. There's a live link right here. Good morning, Monica. Hey, Maria. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm ready for the M&Ms to do their thing. The M&Ms. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any interesting <laughs> dreams last night? You know, I had so many of them that um, they were kind of like they ran into each other. And what I do is, here's a hint. If you ever want to remember your dreams, because most people say, oh, I don't remember. If you remember one symbol or one thing of the dream, it'll all come back. You don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and write things down and record them. Just remember one thing about it. And then all the feelings come back, and all the dream, and the dream comes back. But with me, I happen to have a lot of different ones. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think because I read some disturbing news yesterday about the killing of these anim these animals, and I, I love animals so much in Africa, right. and seeing those the images on Twitter of those stupid people, right? You know, and then the their little cubs that are around the, the dead mother. It's just, it, it disturbed me so much that I think that that's what took control of the dream. Because what happens in a dream is that your body's trying to get rid of the things that are bothering you. So you, you tend to replay it so that you can release it. Right. Well, that's a good way of looking at it. But uh, even yeah. when you do have a whole jumble of different dreams, uh, is there usually a theme running throughout them? Actually, a dreams are divided into three parts, which is why it doesn't make sense. The first part of the dream is something, you might be going through something that is bringing up insecurity or, let's say, feelings of unworthiness or feelings of not being confident or feelings of struggle. And the first part of the dream actually takes you back to where that started, which is why a lot of people say, I always have a dream that starts out in the, the family home where I grew up. Well, it's trying to tell you that that's where that particular uh, emotion or the event that that triggered that emotion first began. The middle part of the dream is telling you how it's manifesting in, in, in your life right now. And the last part of the dream is actually the solution. However, with dreams, a lot of it, it especially the solution and, and the middle part, it comes through symbolically, so you have to understand about symbols. Mm -hmm. And there's a great book that's got, I think, almost 2,000 symbols, and it's the only book I've ever read that is accurate, and it's called The Dream Book by Betty Bethard. Oh, I recommend that book all the time. I think Isn't her book is great. Well, especially with clients that want to or they're gifted to work with their dreams, I, I always recommend that book. I've never seen a better one in all the years, and that book's got to be at least ever. 30 years old. And then I get the people that say, you know, how come I don't remember my dreams? And I said, well, that's because you're too busy during the day and you're not taking breaks every two hours. You need to let your brain rest. And even if you walk away from what you're doing for five minutes, it'll reset. It, it allows the right brain to take over and it lets the left brain rest. And I would say just go for five minutes, ten minutes, and go grab a snack like something healthy and then come back to work. But then, you know, so many people are workaholics, Maria. I, know. I mean, I'm guilty. I had to put a little timer on my computer that tells me every 15 minutes that 15 minutes is up, you know. Right. <laughs> it's, it's easy to sit in front of it, especially with the work we do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm on Skype con yeah, I'm on Skype constantly and on FaceTime doing readings, you know. And so after a while, you know, and, and there's, oh, my gosh. Speaking of that, this is a little off topic, but it's going to fit in very nicely. There is eye exercises you can do because we're constantly looking at the screen. It's about, you know, 12, 15, uh, you know, inches away from us. And if you go to YouTube and type in Paul McCartney Eye Yoga, you'll learn about 
the exercises, there's only three of them, and they work. Oh, my gosh, they straighten your vision. Otherwise, you get blurred vision. But going back to the dream, sorry about that, um, that dream book is, is so good. And one of the things that people tell me is once I tell them to take their breaks, they immediately start remembering their dreams because we're learning all the time. I mean, the universe is constantly broad back, broadcasting back to us through experience and through the dream state. It's it's teaching. So why not take a break every ten every two hours for ten minutes mm-hmm. and allow yourself to be uh, to release old stuff and also to learn new things. Right. I find I find sometimes several hours later in the day, I could be on the bike at the gym or whatever, and all of a sudden I'll remember my dream. I didn't remember it when I woke up, but I'll remember yeah. it because I'm maybe because I'm doing something that's so mundane. It is. When you're when your brain's on autopilot, it releases the right brain. That's like when you have you ever thought of this? I, I mean this is pretty interesting. When you're doing dishes, don't your thoughts get really loud? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Usually yeah, just concentrating like on your, seeing okay, if the look dish at three is different, clean. Four different things, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. When you're washing dishes, it's autopilot, so your thoughts get very loud. When you're taking a shower, autopilot, left brain knows what it's doing, a right brain, thoughts get very loud, instinct gets very loud, feelings get very um, you know strong. Driving your car, automatic, your thoughts get very loud. A lot of people say, yeah, I do a lot of thinking in the car. Yeah, because, you, you know, your mind is giving you information that's important. Now, blow drying your hair, another thing that's automatic. You know, it's, pay attention to these little things and you'll see how loud your thoughts really are mm-hmm. and pay attention to what they're saying. Well, okay. Well, let's get back on topic with dreams now. Uh, yeah. a, lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of people discount their dreams. They don't think that they're important. How important do you think dreams are? <laughs> you know, and nightmares are actually better. They're not, they're scary for a reason, but they're not bad. They're actually a good thing because a person is so busy during the day, they're passed out at night, so they have to have a nightmare in order to get the education and the, and the message. The message just comes through, you know, so that the person gets scared enough to talk about it. But if you know how to interpret dreams using the dream book, uh, you'll see that actually nightmares are trying to tell you something like take breaks during the day and listen to the messages come through. If you're not going to do this, you're out of balance. So therefore, we have to throw you a nightmare. Uh-huh. So it's not a bad thing. Well, speaking of nightmares, you know, several, uh, several listeners had sent in some dreams. And uh, I do have one that certainly sounds like a nightmare to me. Uh, this was a dream that uh, an older gentleman had, uh, she, and uh, his wife told me about it. She said, my husband had this nightmare at like five in the morning. He told me he saw the devil, and a lot of people were in his room battling with him because they wanted to touch him and take him away. He said that he battled mm-hmm. back with them and eventually was able to wake up and get out of bed. He walked out of his room, and he saw the bright light of a hundred lamps and walked a little bit more and saw the sunlight of early morning. Yeah, that's easy to interpret. Uh, because I've been interpreting dreams since the early 80s, I, I've, I've memorized all these symbols and I've asked for certain symbols to, you know, I give them meaning in other words. So what's happening is that somewhere in his life he's still battling within himself because he's getting this repeatedly. He's not getting the message. Anytime you have dreams that, that repeat constantly, it's because we're not getting the message. So it has to repeat, like it's, it's, you know, the old saying goes, if you don't learn from the past, it's doomed to repeat itself. Mm-hmm. Same thing with a dream or a nightmare. So he's having battles within himself. You know, there's probably uh, some part of him that is, um, has hold, is holding on to either a negative experience or that he, he needs to be more positive about certain things. Because dreams always represent ourselves. They don't represent other people. However, when you dream about other people, you're looking at their traits, and it's actually reflecting who you are. So what it's telling him is that the end result of this is, is that he goes into light, which that tells me that he needs to be more spiritual on a daily basis. Not A lot of people tell me how spiritual they are, and I'll go, no, you're not. Mm-hmm. And then they like, they're like floored that I said that because they think I'm being mean, but I'm not. When you know spiritual information, that doesn't mean that you're living a spiritual life because it's how we live. Uh-huh. It's not what we believe in. So... When we're living a spiritual life, that means that you, you have to believe that there is a relationship in tandem with something greater and that we, have, we live in peace. And this is why I love what Buddha said. When you're anxious, you're living in the future. When you're depressed, you're living in the past. And when you're at peace, you're in the now. And that's what we want, want to achieve is that peace. 
So all he's doing is fighting with himself. He's trying to find some peace of mind. And um, it's being projected as the devil, which represents, we, don't, we know that the devil doesn't exist, but it represents negativity. So that's, how, that's his dream. Mm -hmm. Well, that totally makes sense. I mean, there's always many layers to dreams as well. Because I know for myself, you know, once I really get to know my clients, it becomes much easier for me to interpret their dreams for them. Yes, exactly. Uh, That's true. So, you know, when, but the, the, if he knows this information about the dream, he'll know where to start. Mm -hmm. Right, you know? right. But when I saw, you know, the bright, the bright light of hundreds of lamps and he's walking towards the light... You know, I, yeah. I also know, you know, on a physical level, he's not doing well. He's very old. And it could very well be that he's starting to have fear about crossing over. Well, exactly. There's a, that's the battle within him. And that's what he has to figure out because I don't know him. You know, I'm not tuned into him right now. I'm just interpreting dreams. But the conflict is within him, and that would be definitely fear. Mm -hmm. Of course. But I would say, you know, find peace, because that's what that light's representing, is find peace within himself as he's in this world. So everybody usually has fear uh, before they cross over, and then when they get closer to that, they find peace. Right. You know, why? Because we get visitations. But now we're talking about, you know, <laughs> crossing over, so <laughs> they're all connected, aren't they? <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, they are. As a matter of fact, I highly recommend everybody read while they're still alive the book Your Life After Death by Michael Rakia. Uh, because oh, it will okay. give people something, you know, to figure out and what they can do to make sure they as, uh, as, assume a much better position in their next incarnation, wherever that happens to be. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that sounds really, really good. I'm going to put that on my list as well. I have one that is about a man who died and came back. His name is Billy Fingers. Yeah, that's a great book. Online. He's good. Yeah, that's, and his book is really good. Yeah, that's a great book, too. Uh, Billy Fingers. <laughs> another thing I wanted to ask you, because I've studied Native American spirituality for so many decades and taught it, uh, yeah. Native Americans believe that this reality is the actual dream and the dream space is real. Yes. What do yes, you think of that? Yeah, well, it is because when we cross over, we wake up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, because I communicate with, the, I'm a medium, that's what I do most of the time, and um, this is what they all say, you're asleep, everybody here is awake, and we're, that's why we call it home, but you go there in order to learn lessons, and the lessons that you learn are the ones that you create through your own thoughts and feelings and beliefs, and then your world is capable of, of reflecting them back to you as an experience, so yeah, this is a dream state, everything's changing based on how we change our thinking. Mm -hmm. When we're really awake, when we cross back and go back home, we know that it's all about love, and and they're in a state of love. Mm -hmm. Once they get through all their conflicts and they have life review and stuff, then they're in a place where it is it's pure love. And so we realize that the only thing that's important and the most important thing is love. Love of self has been the most difficult since I've been doing readings since 1972 professionally. The most difficult lesson that I found that still exists today is people have a hard time loving themselves. They still criticize themselves. They parent themselves the way they were parented. If they were in an abusive situation or criticized uh, constantly, then they do that to themselves, and therefore they're going to create exactly not what they want, but who they are. Right. So, yeah, this place is an interesting school. <laughs> interesting school. But, you know what I've been saying for decades, Monica? Huh. I say, I help, I'm trapped in someone else's nightmare and I can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel, Groundhog Day, when I wake up back here. Oh. oh my gosh. Well, what I've taken an interest in lately is to start connecting with my parallel lives and start talking to her mm -hmm. or him wherever they are, because that's, an, that's a fascinating subject, because sometimes we're stuck, but we have the ability to connect with all dimensions all the time. Right. And so I think that when we, when we dream, not out think, I know, that when we dream, we're getting this information from universal consciousness that is giving it to us, but it's symbolic. Like, if I speak German and you speak French, and I ask you in, in German, do you want an apple? You're not going to know what I'm saying. Right. But if I hand you an apple and I put a smile on my face, you're going to take it and, and you know, you're going to say yes in your language. So 
a picture speaks a thousand words. Symbols are a much easier way for the universe to communicate to all of us that speak different languages. Mm-hmm. That's why it's, the dreams are symbolic. Now, every once in a while, we do have prophetic dreams, but it doesn't happen that often. I used to have them in the, I'd say maybe late 70s. I'd have prophetic dreams, and I'd mm-hmm. wake up, and I just knew something was going to happen, and sure enough, there it was, you know. So, But that doesn't happen as often. You can ask for these things to happen. But I would suggest starting off with basics and learning the simple symbology mm-hmm. of how to interpret a dream. Right. Well, I had uh, I have had friends who... Uh, had very predicted uh, predictive dreams when it came to natural disasters. Oh yeah, it was yeah, like they could a... dream it two days before, and it, then it would happen exactly where and how mm-hmm. it, they dreamt it. Yeah, that that is a gift. That is a gift, and uh, I, I hope she wrote these things down. My my cousin, who was, I think she was at the time maybe thirteen or fourteen, because the intuitive or psychic ability comes from mother's side of the family, and my my cousin. Uh, saw 9-11 two days before it happened and told everybody about it. She said the, the buildings are going to come down in New York. And sure enough, it was 9-9 that she got the, the, the message and she saw it in a dream. So uh, I did see a plane crashing and it was flight, I believe it was 880 in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I saw that happening. But I don't want to see disasters. My mother used to see that. She's also very intuitive. She used to see disasters in her dream, and she finally said, no, I don't want it. If I can't change it, I don't want to know. Well, I could certainly understand that, but this particular Mm -hmm. woman had quite the gift for earthquakes, more than anyone I had ever seen. It was like she was directly connected to them. She could feel them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would take her ability and probably expand it for other things Mm. to start getting perhaps maybe some inventions because you know that... Leonardo da Vinci and Einstein and Nikola Tesla, all re- they received visions. Some of them, they got, as soon as they woke up in the morning, they immediately got and, and wrote down and drew the inventions that they received in the middle of the night. And they, they credit that to extraterrestrials who come through in the middle of the night and, and give them this information. So there is no limit to what we can do when, when we actually study dreams. It's pretty fascinating. Right. And, well, I think the first thing to do is, you know, people need to learn to journal their dreams. You know, and, and I used to actually yeah. teach classes on that. You know, give your dream a movie title. You know, what? put the date <laughs> on it, you know. Put the date on it, right? Whatever it is you remember, even if it's just a smell or a color. Uh, and then go back. Idea. Yeah, and then I would say just go back in a couple of weeks and look at the date and see if and what the dream was trying to tell you. Yeah. Uh, so people yeah. could use a computer. They could keep a recorder by their bed if they don't want to write out their dreams. You know, and yeah. just don't jump out of bed first thing in the morning. Lie there for a couple of minutes and and just ponder your dream. Yeah. yeah, just remember one thing about the dream, and it'll all come back. That absolutely works every single time. Right. And, and I know that. And never go to bed with the news on. Oh, never. that's for sure. I have to watch comedy before I go to bed. I, I watch Seinfeld. <laughs> I don't want any of that garbage in my head. It's bad enough that almost every day I wake up with my first thought being Trump. I don't want it to be my last thought at night. Oh, my God. Oh, I know. We have to disconnect from that collective consciousness. It's too messy and it's too uh, negative right now. I know. And so, it really, it is. I can't. I can't. I can't anymore. We've got a cuckoo person, you know. He's like, I think he has dementia. I think it's beyond that. But let's get back to dreams. I have a couple more I want to go over with you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm chit-chatting with you, Maria. Well, we are. We are. And I'm trying to keep us on target. Uh, Thank you. Okay, this is from Rosie. Rosie says, I sometimes have these dreams since I was little of being somewhere and not being able to find someone or get to them. And all the directions are lost or jumbled, but it's such a tragic feeling of being separated and not being able to get back to that person. She said, probably stemming from being taken away from my birth mother as an infant. But it amazes me, she said, that I can actually have tears and cry in my sleep and then wake up and come back to this reality. Well, you know, there's feelings of abandonment there, which actually kicks off the dream, and it goes back to her childhood. Remember that the, the beginning of a dream always go back, always goes back to when it started, when that particular emotion started or feeling of abandonment started. And so now what she needs to link up is she needs to feel like she's not alone. 
So I would say, again, once again, it's like so clear to me that she needs to link up with her higher power and have a relationship with that higher power. Whatever she chooses to call it, it doesn't matter. It's love. Some people call it God, the higher power, the I am, source, spirit, whatever. Uh, I don't call it the universe because that would be limiting right. the higher power. The, the higher power created the universe. So I don't like that one. But I think that she needs to not feel alone and abandoned. She's not. She's separating herself from it. She needs to acknowledge her, her that she is one with love. And when she does that, she's going to find that peace of mind. And she, you know, this will help her let go. And she has that dream also because she needs to let go of that feeling of abandonment. But that no, last I, part that I gave you is a solution. Right. But what's really good about it is she realized that it probably comes from having been taken away from her birth mother when she was born. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so you That's know, there's exactly a, at least she started. could at least she could figure out where it's coming from. But obviously, the mm-hmm. the pain of that abandonment uh, yeah, she can has still to, make her cry let, all these years later. Yeah, she needs to let that go. You know that <clears throat> because we do choose our parents, and so therefore our experience a lot of time is karmic. That maybe we were assholes towards them in another incarnation, and so but we don't have to suffer for the rest of our lives. Mm-hmm. You know, otherwise we can create a pity pot. You know, I always say, get right. off the cross, we need the wood. Uh-huh. You know, and <laughs> I just throw that in there just to get people off of being heavy, you know. Right. And so one thing I, I tell you know, because kids have nightmares too, and they have dreams. The boogeyman, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the best techniques that I learned that's really, really effective is to have them write down on a little piece of paper, the boogeyman no longer comes to my dreams or has any control over me. And then you take a plastic cup, you know, like a red cup or a plastic clear cup and you um, fill it halfway with water and you put the note inside there stick it in the freezer and freeze it now of course paper rises so it's going to be in you know at the top so then you go back uh, to the tap water and fill it to the top and then put it back in the freezer so the note is now frozen in the middle and you put the date on the outside and you tell your children and especially if you use clear cups you know little girls like colors use food coloring so it makes it, you know, pleasant for them. Every time they open the freezer, they say, ha, ha, you don't have power over me. I have power over you. And so it really does cut back their, their nightmares and their, the boogeyman and stuff because they froze them in time. Right. Well, that's a great uh That's a great suggestion. You know, I've worked with a lot of people, and even with my own kid, uh, when they have night terrors. You know, some kids have night terrors beyond nightmares. Uh, yeah. And they can't, you know, and a lot of parents will say they can't even wake them up from it. Uh, and, and also understand that with, because co- I studied color therapy, this, this ties into dreams. Don't ever paint your kid's room yellow, because yellow is the emotional chakra, the third chakra, which is right in the, the solar plexus. And that brings up, what it does is it amplifies emotions, so it makes a night terrors and dreams and, and nightmares even worse. I gave this therapy to, I mean, this technique to a lot of people. They changed the color of the room to like a really calm blue, and the nightmares stopped. Mm, Maybe that's why I don't have nightmares, because my my room's (laughs) a nice calm blue. Also, the colors that you cover yourself with, don't wear red to bed. Mm -hmm. You know, don't cover yourself with red, because that tends to stimulate a lot of emotion. It's the first chakra, and it can bring about anger. Right. Well, don't another light, thing is yeah, is to put a protection. Light, you know, <laughs> I know a lot of people don't think about putting a protection around their sacred space. As far as I'm concerned, is your bedroom because oh, that's where point. spirit talks to you. That's yeah, your private point. connection. So you know, when I hear people saying they're having problems or feeling like they're having that sleep paralysis or whatnot, I will always tell them to smudge their bedroom. You know, maybe throw a dream mm-hmm. catcher in there and put their intentions out. You know, in yeah. these days that we're living right now, I'm sure you will agree. If you were putting protection around yourself, spiritual protection around yourself once a day, you need to do that two or three times a day now. I do that in the morning, and you're absolutely right. Sometimes in the middle of the day, I might just accidentally flip it on MSNBC or some kind of a news station, and I'm like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Time for another protection. <laughs> but I understand. Um, so there are a lot of things you can do, you know, and I wanted to just cover what I was saying with kids uh, because it's another technique that might help people out there. If you have a child that's always, you know, freaking out in bed or whatnot, uh, mm-hmm. is to keep a basin of water by the bed. 
And as when you go into your child's room and they're freaking out, just get them to sit up on the bed and stick their feet in that water. And that breaks it. It just totally oh, breaks it. I love that. I love that. I've heard about using water, but actually speaking your fears into it. And then when you wake up in the morning, um, you know, you also say, this is what I want instead. When you wake up in the morning, you drink some of the water and it tends to calm you down. These are things I learned like decades ago. I know. It's like know? all this old stuff is coming up today. <laughs> it's all this old stuff yeah. I did like 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, but exactly. one of the other things I also did, and, and a lot of parents out there should do this to encourage your children to share their dreams with you. Uh, you know, when mm-hmm. my kids were little, the first thing in the morning when I go in to kiss them awake, I would just, you know, sit on the edge of it, especially my son, because he was fabulous with dreams. Uh, I would sit on the edge of his bed and gently wake him with a little kiss on his cute little face. And I would say, and then I would ask him, what did you dream about last night? Like it was an adventure for us to share our dreams. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, the recall that kid had was out of this world. And wow. he also had the ability to come into my dreams and his father's dreams. And when we would talk about them the next day, he was like, yeah, I was there. <laughs> such awareness i know what a family <laughs> i love it i absolutely love it you know and and one of the things i love about dreams is when you get visitations from family members who've crossed over mm-hmm. that's a lot of fun because you get to hug them because when you're out of your body you're in their dimension so therefore they feel physical to you right um when they come to you in the middle of the night and you wake up and you see them they have to lower their frequency, which is much harder for them to do. But when you go to their dimension, you can actually hug them and they feel solid because they are solid in that dimension. Mm-hmm. So uh, I do that a lot with my pets when they, when they pass away. Is I, I said, I want to dream about you. I want to tug you and I want to, you know, see you one more time. And then sure enough, they, they will eventually come through. When you ask for anything, it does come through. Right. That's yeah. why I always add, be careful what you ask for because you will get it. Yeah, and and this is how I found out a lot about my past lives as well, which is another subject, but I did ask for it to come through in my dreams. Right. And I did see myself without the trauma. I erased the emotion. I was just like the observant of it. And sure enough, it was like validated much later. So it, dreams are much more than what people understand. It's a whole science that you have to really understand and, and uh, know how to interpret the symbols. Otherwise, you're lost. But this is why they have people like you and me, because we can help them with it. And well, I love it. I love interpreting dreams for people, especially if I know them. But sometimes I dream for people. Like, I will dream messages for people. I'll call them the next day, tell them, hey, I had a dream last night. This is what yeah. happened. Uh, I and, and you know what? They always tell me, wow, that's exactly what's happening in my life, had you know. See? Well, duh, Maria. Look what you do for a living. You're I know. good at it. I you know. know. <laughs> I, but I love, I love you got to tell you, I love working with dreams the most. You know, for yeah. at least 15 years, I kept an, an actual dream journal for mm-hmm. at least 15 years. And I mean, it got more and more involved because the more you work with them, the more detail you get. But then exactly. it, it was at some exactly. point that it just shifted to where I know I just knew that I didn't need to keep record of it because I have such a good recall of it mm-hmm. and, you know, an understanding. Yeah. But remember, that's after 15 years. Yeah, that, you're very disciplined with that. I'm not. Well, I, for I, me, it was fun. You know, I wanted to know all there is mm-hmm. to know. You know how I am. I can't help myself. <laughs> uh, a, little, uh, a little dream question from Gina. She okay. says, I wake up drenched in tears sometimes, and I've even felt a person's touch that is so real that I think, how could it not be? What is she drenched in? Tears. Crying. Oh, she's crying. Okay. That's a dream of release. So I, I'm suspecting that she probably doesn't show her emotions that much, and she doesn't know how to process them during the day. One of the best ways to cleanse out a lot of that blocked energy is to cry. So it's happening for her in her dream state, because we just can't go around being robots and pretending that we're just so professional and nothing bothers her. And mostly people that I know, of, they do block that stuff. They shove it back down, but the body doesn't want it. So it cries in the middle of the night in order, it's like for equilibrium, it balances them again. Because otherwise that kind of energy is such density that it's what creates diseases and illnesses. So my feeling is that she's releasing. That's a releasing dream. Right. Well, I think even the fact that she says she's even felt a person's touch that's so real 
that somebody obviously is comforting her during that emotional exactly. release. Exactly. I was going to say either an angelic being or somebody in her family who's around her. And the more that you pay attention to that, the more that you'll get revelations of about who it is. Like when I went into surgery last week, uh, I felt my father right there with me and my cousin Paul, who died in, in June. And I said, hi, Dad. Hi, Paul. Thanks for being with me, you know, because when you're going to get surgery, you get scared. Right, exactly. I fill the room with angels when I walk in for surgery. Yeah. <laughs> and I make sure it's first thing in the morning when the doctor's actually alert. That, <laughs> yeah, mine was at 8. It was, I got there at 8.30, so... Um, but then they were late with me, and I had more time to spend with them, which was really kind of nice, you know. And right. I, you could just feel them. A little quick could, some visit. Some people, some people, you just talk to them, but they don't feel them. You have to be sensitive enough to feel when they're right there, and that's when you just start asking questions and listening for answers. And and again, this is happening when I was half awake and half asleep. A lot of things come during the twilight sleep when you're an alpha. Right. And interestingly, and you know this for a fact, that when we do readings, we're in alpha level. We're not in the beta level. Exactly. Monica, we have, to take, a sh- yeah, we have to take a short break, but we have, a couple, we have some more dreams that you guys sent in when we get back. And uh, I'm going to also talk about the dark side of dreams. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Maria Heller. If you're enjoying this show, please consider listening to the rest of it along with hundreds of other hours of education by a small subscription on my site. Get over to maria.net, M-E-R-I-A dot net. You are the only thing that supports this show. There's no corporate control and there's plenty of education on site. So please consider either a subscription or a donation to keep the work going. There are too many alternative voices out there that are being silenced because of lack of support. So if you don't want MSM to be the only mind-controlling news out there, please consider supporting the people that support you and uh, help us all save something for the future for our children. Thank you so much.